to welcome you to today's event with Dr. Tariq Massoud of Harvard's Kennedy Center and our moderator, uh, William Zartman, uh, Professor Emeritus here at SAIS. Uh, today's event is co-organized by the Conflict Management Program at SAIS and our team at MEI, and it's always a great honor to work with SAIS. Thank you uh, for co-hosting us. You have such great spaces. So. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the title of the program today, The Arab Spring, Pathways to uh, Repression and Reform, comes from the latest book that Dr. Massoud has co-authored with fellow Middle East experts Jason Brownlee and Andrew Reynolds. And it has set out to address some of the um, key questions raised by the Arab Spring phenomenon, primarily why did regime change take place in only four countries, and why has democratic change proved so elusive um, in the countries that made attempts to transition away from authoritarianism. We are honored to be hosting Dr. Massoud's first Washington uh, presentation of his book, uh, which he will be signing uh, afterwards. We're selling copies for $30, which is a discount uh, from the online price. I'm also delighted that today's event corresponds with the wonderful news out of Tunisia about the Nobel Prize being awarded to Tunisian civil society activists uh, who work to bring Tunisia back from the brink of disaster. Uh, after Tarek presents on his book, uh, Dr. Zartman will engage him in a brief discussion before opening uh, the floor to questions from the uh, audience, so please get your questions uh, prepared. I look forward to hearing Dr. Zartman's views on the Arab Spring as well. Uh, he is the Jacob Blaustein Distinguished Professor Emeritus of International Organization and Conflict Resolution and former director of the Conflict Management and African Studies programs at SAIS. That's a mouthful. He's one of the most distinguished experts in the field of negotiation analysis and peacemaking, and the author of far too many books uh, to mention here on North Africa as well as on sub-Saharan uh, African politics. Uh, but before I yield the floor to Professor Zartman, uh, I just want to encourage everyone to sign up for MEI's 69th uh, annual conference uh, on Friday, November 13th, an auspicious day at the Capitol Hilton. We'll have top, region, top experts from the region uh, and the U.S. on four panels discussing uh, regional security dynamics in the wake of the Iran deal, uh, U.S. policy on the Middle East in the last year of the Obama administration, and uh, the use of new media and entertainment to challenge uh, conventions and norms um, uh, across the region, among other topics. And this conference is free and open to the public, so I hope a lot of you SAI students will come out for it. Uh, the night before, at our annual banquet, we are going to be awarding Egyptian-American Mohammed El Arian, a financial guru uh, who coined the phrase, the new normal. And, um, Sheikha Hur al Qasimi, who transformed the Middle East arts scene through her amazing uh, Sharjah Biennial. Uh, so please join us for that as well. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Zartman. This is indeed an auspicious and coincidental occasion for a number of reasons. Um, one is that at exactly the same time, another book with the same title, The Arab Spring, Negotiating in the Shadow of the Intifada, um, has arrived. Um, and I hope that you will all come out for the presentation of that uh, same book. So enough of shameless self-promotion. Um, the other reason why it's, uh, as has been mentioned, why it's an auspicious occasion is that the Nobel Peace a prize has been awarded uh, wisely, which is not always the case, um, to uh, the quartet uh, who made the difference uh, in Tunisia. Um, it made the difference, however, takes some kind of explanation. And uh, I think for that one has to put oneself into a structural analysis of the uh, events within the Arab Spring. And the book that we're going to be talking about, hearing about, and then talking about, and asking about, I hope, um, uh, is, I think, the first, really, to get into a, um, a broad brush and structural analysis. Um, the, the one uh, 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 mistake, or the one, one issue I would take with the book is that it, sa it says it's uh, going to be um, a inductive rather than deductive, and I think it's rather deductive, intelligently deductive analysis, looking at uh, structural elements uh, that then are applied and tested and so on to look at the uh, at the Arab Spring. 
Um, one of their, there are a couple challenges, really, of, the, uh, of a deductive analysis of this kind. Uh, a deductive analysis begins um, uh, with a big N. Uh, it, it has to do that in order to uh, start out with uh, a, a deductive framework. Um, yet the Arab Spring is a mighty small N. I mean, it's not explaining what happened in, Tunis uh, what happened in Tunisia's but what happened in Tunisia? There's only one of it. Um, and if Tunisia looked like Egypt in the beginning, then it has to explain, as it does, why Tunisia and Egypt turned out so differently. Um, and uh, this, this book does masterfully. Uh, but at the same time, a structural analysis can get lost in its structure up there uh, and end up the paragraph by saying, uh, so this is what happened in Tunisia. Uh, and uh, then pass on. And at the same time, there, this book uh, goes into a very careful uh, description, analysis, analytical description of individual cases so that you're not left on its authority, but uh, left with an understanding of what happened uh, on the ground after looking at it in this broad brush lens. So I'm very happy to uh, be invited to the chair session uh, with uh, Tariq Masoud uh, from the uh, Kennedy Center in, in Harvard, um, uh, who Harvard made its way all the way down to Washington, um, and uh, who will tell us about uh, his message and analysis, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion. Um, I, I'm supposed to be an element in the discussion, but as we go, well, as he goes along, I would uh, invite you to raise questions in your own mind and have them ready to pop at him when he comes. Tariq. Thank you very much. So I very cleverly put my remarks right here, and now they are gone. Does anybody know where they are? There's a bunch of, there was like a sheaf of like 20 papers here. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I have to write it down. Okay. So let me thank uh, the Middle Eastern Institute um, and particularly uh, Kate Seeley for uh, organizing uh, this event today. I want to thank uh, Mark Sheeland and Claron, uh, Claron Goschke for getting me here. Uh, I want to thank the NHTSA School for hosting this event. I actually used to live right across the street many years ago, so this is uh, like a, a homecoming. I wasn't actually very happy when I lived across the street. Um, and I want to thank uh, Professor Zartman for agreeing to lend his auspices to this talk. I have not met uh, Professor Zartman before. In fact, when I just met him a minute ago, he says, I have no idea who you are, but I, I have known Professor Zartman for many years intimately through my footnotes. I think the first thing I ever wrote about the Middle East uh, cited uh, Professor Zartman. He's truly a giant in our field, and having him sit here a few uh, feet away is pretty thrilling and a little bit intimidating, especially when he says, what are the problems with X? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm here, uh, according to the publicity materials and the posters, to speak about this new book, uh, The Arab Spring, Pathways of Repression and Reform, which I co-wrote with uh, Jason Brownlee of the University of Texas at Austin and Andrew Reynolds of the University of North Carolina, who are two, true, two truly wonderful uh, intellectual partners. And the principal aim of this book, as uh, Professor Zartman uh, mentioned, is to offer a unified and methodologically rigorous explanation for the divergences in the outcomes among the Arab countries that experienced uprisings in 2011 and 2012. And what we ask in this book, and I hope we answer, are three questions. The first is why did only some countries experience mass protests that challenge regimes? Second, why were only some regimes able to hold on in the face of those mass protests while others collapsed? And then third, why in the places where dictators actually were compelled to resign have the outcomes been so dismal with that small exception of Tunisia? And one thing that we noticed when we began writing this book is that there was a great deal of literature already on these questions and the answers all tended to be highly voluntaristic and focused on proximate causes. They would emphasize things like the mobilization strategies of protest leaders or the decisions of generals and politicians during uh, particularly tense times of transition. Um, and in this book, what we did is we put those explanations to the test, and we concluded that the outcomes of Arab Spring uprisings and subsequent transitions 
were better explained by much deeper structural factors that you could have observed long before this season, uh, the Arab Spring, even began. Uh, to kind of uh, put this uh, epithely, as I've written elsewhere, the Arab Spring was a drama whose script was written long before the dramatis personae even took the stage. It was not an, uh, an improv show, right? The script had been written uh, long before. Now, let me pause here and tell you, I still don't know how to give book talks, so this is my second book. And I'm never sure what I should do. Should I sit down and actually go through uh, the argument and the most compelling evidence for the argument? And this is probably be the most easy thing for me. It would also save you money, uh, because then you wouldn't need to buy the book. Um, but then it would rob my kids of some much needed input into their small college fund. So what I want to do today is not repeat the argument of the book, which I very much hope you will read, but rather talk about the book's implications, uh, and particularly its policy implications. Um, and this makes sense since I teach at the Kennedy School. I wish I were at the Kennedy Center. It would mean I would have more artistic ability. But the Kennedy School of Government, we do policy. And um, in this uh, uh, desire to think about the policy implications of this book, it's not simply a function of uh, where I teach, but I'm also inspired by this current presidential campaign season. Because what I notice is that much of what uh, the presidential candidates, particularly on the Republican side, have been spending their time talking about has to do with the countries that are the focus of this book, the Arabic-speaking Muslim-majority countries of the Middle East. And as we all know here, this is a part of the world that since 2011 has been aflame. So the if I took any one of you, any one of you in a dark alley and put a gun to your head and asked you, tell me what you know about what's going on in the Middle East, I often do this, um, uh, you would say, you would talk about Syria and Iraq, right? You would talk about these countries that have essentially broken down into their component ethnic parts with huge swaths of both controlled by a radical Islamist uh, militia that fancies itself the reincarnation of the 1,400-year-old caliphate. Uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that more than 4 million Syrians, uh, which is a little under a quarter of that country's population, have fled. More than 200,000 have been killed. And if you watch uh, the nightly news, you know that many of those who have fled are banging on the doors of Europe, awakening all kinds of fears, reasonable and unreasonable, in, uh, in that part of the world. Elsewhere in the Arab world, the picture is less grim, but only by comparison to Syria and Iraq. A brief democratic experiment in Egypt, the largest and I say most important country in the, in the region, because I'm, my people are from Egypt, has given way to a military coup and a season of terror and Islamist insurgency. And many of you may know that last month, uh, uh, the Egyptian army uh, massacred uh, uh, more than a dozen Mexican tourists who were on a picnic in the desert, and to me this is as stark an illustration as you will find of just how much uh, Egypt has fallen from the very hopeful heights that uh, it occupied during those 18 days in Tahrir Square in January 2011. Libya and Yemen, two other countries where we also thought democracy might alight after popular protests led to the uh, uh, expulsion of dictators. Those two places are now embroiled in civil wars. And in Yemen in particular, Saudi Arabia and its allies seem engaged in a systematic bombing campaign that appears to me ineffective at doing anything other than adding to the miseries of the inhabitants of that famously immiserated country. And so that brings us to the only bright spot which is Tunisia, a tiny little country of 10 million people, right? This is smaller than Cairo, okay? Uh, but today it counts as the region's only democracy. But even Tunisia, I would argue, Tunisia's democracy is being sorely tested. When I was last there uh, in March, it was the week that terrorists had killed uh, 21 tourists in the National uh, Museum. A few months after that visit, uh, in June, terrorists struck again. They gunned down almost 40 tourists who were sunning themselves on a beach. And there's this growing chorus in Tunisia demanding that the president, who, by the way, was an ally of the regime that was ousted in 2011, demanding that this man get tough and crack down. And I would submit to you that durable liberal democracy is not necessarily made of that uh, in, in those kinds of environments. So, 
this is a part of the world that whoever um, is lucky or unlucky enough to succeed Barack Obama <coughs> as uh, president is going to be vexed by whether they are a Republican or a Democrat. And luckily, I think our book is not just an explanation of an historical event that has passed. It is also, I think, a useful guide to the future. And so I thought I'd use this afternoon to talk about uh, to reflect on the things that I believe our book would can tell the next president or people who make policy and help them understand about this most troubled part of the world. Now, if I were smarter or more creative, I'd come up with a list of 10 lessons. Right? I'd say, okay, there are 10 implications, um, but I could only think of five. Um, and I should also say that my co-authors shouldn't necessarily be held uh, responsible for uh, the five implications that I'm gonna come up with. Now, how do I move through these uh, slides. I don't know. Okay, we'll figure it out. So, um, so the lesson number one, the first lesson that I want to, uh, 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 that I think we take from this book, thank you, sir, is that democracy in the Arab world, or rather the absence of democracy in the Arab world, is overdetermined. I'll explain what I mean. So many years ago, remember in 2011, as young people were taking to squares in Cairo and in Tunis and in Damascus, we were all thrilled, right? I remember myself uh, when I first learned of this fellow, Wa'il Ghunaym, who was a Google marketing executive, who was one of the organizers uh, of the uh, protest that uh, took place in Tahrir. I was just stunned. I was so hopeful. I said, this is a new kind of political elite that is emerging in Egypt that is going to lead us to democracy. And I'll note, even President Obama was, uh, uh, was caught up in the mood. There was a New York Times story that reported that President Obama said, what I want is for the kids on the street to win and the Google guy to become president, right? We were, all, we were all thrilled. And now, given the litany that I have just uh, described for you, I sort of cringe both at my and the American president's naivete in thinking that uh, a democratic sea change was likely or even possible in that part of the world or that young tech-savvy protesters were somehow going to bring down uh, authoritarian edifices that had build, built up over decades. Now, let me, just to make this point clear, let me quantify for you the full scope of the disappointment in the Arab world today. So this is the, uh, these are Freedom House scores. Everybody here is familiar with Freedom House. These are Freedom House scores for uh, 16 Arab countries, uh, starting from before the Arab Spring, uh, going uh, up to uh, today. Um, and basically, you know, you all know that Freedom House has this weird system where the higher your score is, the worse off you are in terms of civil liberties and political rights. And so what I did is I reversed the scale so the charts uh, make sense. So when lines go up, it's better. When lines go down, it's worse. Okay. So um, six of the 16 countries in the uh, Arab world, actually, so these are only two countries actually do better, right? So the first is Tunisia which is now considered a, 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 almost a free, it is a free country. And then Libya, right? So Libya had bumped up into partly free territory. It's, it's back down again, but it's still better off than it was in 2010. But I would submit to you that this is testament only to the wonderful optimism that the Freedom House folks must have, because I would say that I'm not even sure there is a thing called Libya whose democratic prospects or performance can't even be measured. So we have these two, two, perform, two countries that perform better today than they did before, and really I would say only one. Then we've got six countries who have the exact same Freedom House score today that they did before the Arab Spring began. So stasis. I would note here is the land by the Nile, Egypt, which sort of bumped up a little bit after Mubarak's overthrow during the presidency of Mohamed Morsi before being brought back down again by the military coup that I mentioned. And then we have many of these other countries which have not, you know, the Alger uh, Jordan, Morocco, uh, sort of stable monarchies. Um, but these places have, um, sorry, my slides got my, not only did Kate take my paper, she also disorganized them. Okay. Um, so, um, so these places, pretty much the same throughout the entire period beginning in 2010. 
And then finally, eight countries today actually have worse Freedom House scores than they had at the onset of the Arab Spring. They, things have actually gotten worse in these places. One of them is Iraq, another one is Syria. These are both places where, as we know, uh, uh, you know ISIS really raises the question of whether we can even talk about these places as uh, as stable polities. Another one is Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is much in the news today because its citizens are protesting this government's inability to provide basic services, but I would also submit to you that there's an even bigger threat on the horizon in Lebanon, which is the spillover of the Syrian bloodletting. And what will that and the influx of refugees do for the stability of that polity is an open question. Then other countries in this group of places with declining Freedom House scores are Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, these oil-rich nations of the Arabian Gulf whose overriding obsession has been to stem the tide of what they see as the chaos and instability that originated in their Arab neighbors to the West. So looking at this, the harvest of the Arab Spring has not just been modest, it has been exceedingly depressing. It is regressive. Okay. Now, some of you are going to say, ah, this guy is so pessimistic. Um, doesn't he understand that getting democracy takes time, right? This is often what I hear, that transitions to democracy take time and that the so-called Arab Spring was merely the opening scene in a very long process that will eventually lead the peoples of this region to democratic, responsive, accountable, decent government. I hope that is true, but there are two reasons why I think this rejoinder is glib and unsatisfying. The first is that transitions to democracy don't actually always take time. So let me show you. This is a, 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 um, a chart similar to the one I just showed you, but it's looking at the Warsaw Pact countries uh, from 1989 to 1991, their Freedom House scores. And what do we observe? Unlike the depressingly stable or indeed regressive uh, trend lines in the Arab world, here we observe rapid improvement in the Freedom House scores of all of these uh, places. Uh, the the so-called Velvet Revolutions remade that part of the world with stunning rapidity. Um, so it took, in other words, it took the post-communist world a couple of years to achieve what still seems decades away for the countries of the Arab world. So that's number one. Transitions to democracy don't usually take time, don't, don't have to take time. The second uh, reason that we should be wary of these pronouncements of the inevitably sunny outcomes of long transitions is that they assume that democracy is some endpoint towards which all nations are inevitably inching. And there's no reason, in my view, aside from a natural tendency towards optimism, to believe that this is true. The Arab world today, I would argue, gives us more cause to think that it is inching towards the Hobbesian state of nature than towards decent government. It, gives a, it's, it offers evidence of the law of entropy, uh, if anything. So many of you are going to be asking, okay, why did things go wrong? What could have been done differently in this part of the world so that the Freedom House trend lines of the Arab world would look more like those that we see in Eastern uh, Europe? And here I want to suggest that this is precisely the wrong question. The better question, I think this is what emerges out of our book, is why did we ever think things could go right in the first place? Because if one surveys our accumulated knowledge about how we get and keep democracy, it's difficult to escape this conclusion that the relative absence of liberal democracy in the Arab world is overdetermined. So I, I used this word before. In our profession, we use a lot of jargon. Uh, let me be a bit indelicate. What do I mean when we say overdetermined? When something is screwed six ways to Sunday, we say it's overdetermined. Okay, which means that there are a number of good reasons why it would be unreasonable of us to expect the flourishing of democracy in that part of the world in our lifetimes. We don't have enough time to recite all of these reasons, but I want to discuss two. The first, of course, that you're probably familiar with are these cultural arguments that people often make. Scholars have long argued that there's something about the religion and culture of the Arab world that renders those places uniquely inhospitable to uh, democracy. And over the years, people have made many valiant attempts to uh, demonstrate why these kinds of cultural theories uh, uh, are wrong. Um, and I think uh, uh, for a lot of, um, a lot of this uh, work is, is truly uh, useful. At the same time, 
I think there is still evidence for this idea of some cultural inhospitality to uh, democracy. So let me illustrate it in a couple of ways. Um, you know, some people often say, well, wait a minute, we do surveys in the Arab world and we find that when we ask Arabs, do, what do you think of democracy? Arabs say, yeah, I like it, it's good. Uh, and this is proof that you know, my people are uh, hospitable to democracy. Um, but my view is just because I do a lot of surveys, just because somebody tells a sur survey enumerator something that they like democracy doesn't actually mean that they really do or that they actually know what democracy is or that what democracy means to them is exactly the same as what democracy uh, means to us. After all, the regime that Kim Jong-un presides over is called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, but it's not democratic in ways that are recognizable to us. So here's an illustration of the potential gulf uh, in our understandings of democracy and a little bit of evidence for these cultural uh, people. So the World Values Survey goes around and they ask people a series of questions about democracy. And what they do is they, say, they present to people uh, political institutions, various institutions, and they say, how essential do you think this is to democracy on a scale of one to 10, right? So we'd say the right to vote, how important is this for a democracy? Zero, one means not important, 10 means really important, right? And most people tend to, uh, you know, in the United States, if you ask them the right to vote, they'll say it's really important. Another thing they ask is, having religious authorities interpret the laws, right? And if you look at Americans' responses to this question, we all say, ah, this is not essential to democracy. In fact, you could make the argument inimical to democracy. In Egypt, uh, most people converge on the idea that having religious authorities vet the laws is essential to uh, democracy. Uh, another question uh, that is also, uh, this is from the World Value Survey in 2008. Another question that they asked, which I thought I would show you, is um, another thing they present is, how important is it to democracy that the government takes over, the military takes over when the government is incompetent? And in Egypt, again, most people think that this is essential to democracy. So what I always like to say is that the dismal trajectory that Egypt took in uh, 2011 and 12 and 13, where they first voted for Islamists and then endorsed a military coup, were perfectly predicted by the World Value Survey in 2008. Um, you should be laughing, you're not. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so, I actually don't give a lot of credit to these kinds of cultural explanations, and I've spent a lot of time in my own academic work trying to clear the decks of these kinds of explanations, but I kind of have the luxury of doing so, right, because I'm an academic. I would say for a policymaker, you have to be much more cautious about dismissing pieces of conventional wisdom just because they run afoul of their uh, moral sensibility. So remember though, I said that the, the absence of democracy in the Arab world is overdetermined. That's one argument that people might make. Another argument that people uh, might make, that a second possible cause of the region's lack of democracy is its relative economic underdevelopment. As all of you know, with the exception of the oil rich states, all of the members of the Arab League are middle income and low income countries. And scholars have long recognized that there's a strong correlation between development <laughs> development and democracy, even though we don't quite know exactly why this correlation uh, exists. So for example, one prominent theory holds that this correlation exists because development does things to individual citizens. Right? They become educated and literate. They therefore embrace norms of compromise that are then conducive uh, to uh, democracy. Uh, there are other arguments as well, but let me just illustrate uh, the, the developmental challenge that we observe in the Arab world. So, um, so, in, in, uh, so one of these arguments is that you know, increasing literacy creates democratic citizens. Development creates literacy, creates democratic citizens. So what I did was I took this data from a, 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 an economist named Gregory, Gregory Clark at the University of uh, California at Davis, and what he did was he looks at literacy rates in the British Isles uh, starting in the 18th century. Now, how did they do this, right? Because you couldn't go and like survey people in the 18th century. He actually looks at marriage records. So the percentage of men and women who are actually able to sign their marriage certificate, he infers literacy from that. It's really quite extraordinary work. So this is the trend line of literacy in Britain from uh, 1750 to about 1900, okay? And what I did was I plotted on this line the literacy rates of Arab countries in 2010, right before the Arab Spring begins, okay, of some key Arab countries, okay. And what do we find, okay? So what we find basically is that, you know, my country, Egypt, um, is basically where 
Uh, the British Isles were in the 1870s. Uh, Yemen, close to the 1850s, right? This is many, many, many decades before the introduction of universal adult suffrage in Britain in uh, 1928. So when you look at this kind of comparison, right, which fixes for us just how developmentally backward the Arab world is, it is difficult to be optimistic about uh, Arab prospects. Now, I want to say in our book, we actually argue that economic development helps to sustain democracy through a different pathway. I actually don't think that individual literacy is what matters. But again, you know, the point is, if you're a policymaker, all of the, you can't dismiss these arguments. Um, you, you will have noticed today, and Professor Zartman mentioned, that the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet just won the Nobel Prize. And this quartet, a key player in it, was the uh, General Tunisian Trade Union, or the UGTT. Um, and in our view, this kind of dialogue that you observed in Tunisia, which brought together secularist and Islamist forces, could only exist in a polity where these forces were relatively evenly matched. Right? In Egypt, you could not have such a dialogue because Islamists were so electorally dominant that they felt no need to really engage in this kind of negotiation with their inferiors. And consequently, non-Islamists then went knocking on the door of the barracks, right, to use El Stepan's phrase. And we argue that this balance of competing forces that you observed in Tunisia and the absence of this balance of competing forces that you did not, that, that uh, characterizes Egypt is actually a function of economic development because Tunisia is, was more developed and more urbanized and consequently more industrialized, consequently had a much stronger labor movement uh, than, uh, than Egypt. Um, so um, this, this is just a little bit of an illustration of the developmental divergence between Egypt and Tunisia over the course of the latter half of the 20th century. This is the World Bank's estimate of the percentage of the population that lives in urban areas. And you can see that Tunisia has, is much more urban. And in the book, we explain why this was. We endogenize it to some policies of the Ben Ali regime, but that, that doesn't necessarily matter uh, for here. So, Look, if you're a policymaker, you don't have to buy my argument about why economic development is conducive to democracy and therefore why the absence of economic development in the Arab world uh, it has led to so much democratic breakdown. You just have to be aware that this correlation exists and it's robust. And this is why these comparisons uh, between the Arab Spring and the earlier Velvet Revolution, right? this idea that the Arab Spring could have ever turned out like the Velvet Revolution was always uh, misplaced because the countries of the Warsaw Pact in 1990 were actually ahead of the Arab world development today developmentally. So this is their per capita GDP in 2005 constant dollars back in 1990 for key Warsaw Pact countries compared to Arab countries today. And for the most part, these Warsaw Pact countries were richer back then than the non-oil Arab countries are today. This horizontal line, by the way, represents the per capita income of Argentina in 1976, which is, are we, Argentina in 1976 is a kind of magical country for political scientists because it is the richest democracy ever to have failed. Turkey may soon give it a run for its money. But, um, um, and as you'll see, most Arab countries, including uh, Tunisia, which we've been valorizing, fall below this uh, threshold. So the first lesson of this book is that there are a ton of structural reasons for why we would expect the Arab world to uh, not uh, achieve democracy in the short term. Um, the Arab world is made up of poor countries, with high degrees of illiteracy, with weak civil societies that play ho play, may even play host to cultures whose compatibility with or acceptance of democracy is an open question. So that is the first lesson. It doesn't matter which of these theories you want to buy, there is a wealth of evidence. Okay, that's lesson number one from this book. The second lesson from this book is that the challenge in the Arab world is not establishing democracy. The challenge in the Arab world is establishing states. Okay. When you survey the carnage in Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, it brings nothing to mind so much as Thomas Hobbes' description of life in the so-called state of nature, where life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And when man is left to his own passions and devices, and consequently, life is miserable, right? And what was Hobbes' solution to this? Hobbes' solution to this was Leviathan. 
which he described as a common power to keep us all in awe, right? To which we would surrender some of our liberty in exchange for the security and safety that are necessary for the flourishing of arts, agriculture, industry, commerce, etc. Now, those of us who study the Middle East, and myself included, have typically viewed Leviathan in that part of the world as a bad thing personified by unattractive personages such as Saddam Hussein or Bashar al-Assad or Muammar al-Qadhafi or to a lesser extent Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. And consequently, when the young people took to the public spaces throughout the Arab world and they rose up against their Leviathans, we applauded them not realizing that by bringing down Leviathan, you may are bringing down not just an unsavory character, but the entire state itself. Now, why were these states so brittle, right? Why was it that bringing down um, dictators also meant bringing down the entire state? Some of the answer, as we go into in the book, has to do with the manner in which states were formed. Aside from Egypt and maybe to a lesser extent Tunisia, most of the states of the Arab world, particularly those in the Levant, are of recent vintage carved out of the Ottoman Empire. And if you look at a map, you'll see what my colleague Roger Owen uh, has memorably referred to as the somewhat artificial appearance of Middle Eastern states with their dead straight boundaries that were so obviously the work of a British or French colonial official using a ruler. Um, so these fictive states of the Arab world came about not through the long, arduous processes of war fighting and territorial expansion and retrenchment that we are familiar with from our study of early modern Europe, but basically through the fiat of great powers. And consequently, these states were always uh, feeble. They built up impressive security apparatuses to help them maintain power and keep order, but they were much less successful at forging national identities or at supplanting alternative alternative allegiances from subnational ones like tribe to transnational ones like religion or sect. And so the Arab state, in my view, has always been this rickety construction, misshapen, misbegotten confection held together with a mixture of fear and patronage. And we should have known better than to expect a positive outcome when this fragile equilibrium was disturbed. So let me give you a little bit of uh, data from the book just to kind of concretize this. The World Bank has this measure of government effectiveness, which is defined as the quality of public services, the quality of the civil service, the quality of policy formulation and implementation, the credibility of the government. And we basically use this variable as a kind of proxy for how strong was the state to begin with. Um, and if you look at the average uh, government effectiveness rating for the entire Middle East and North Africa, let me use this one. Um, you find basically that the entire region is in the 50th percentile, so it's in the bottom half. And when we disaggregate to the individual country scores, we find that, you know, it, the only reason it even does that well, the only reason it's in the bottom half as opposed to the bottom 10% is because these tiny countries, these tiny oil-rich countries, which actually do have pretty competent government, they, they bump up the average. But if we look at places like Syria, which is below the 40th percentile. We look at places like Egypt. Um, you know, these are all countries that, are, are un, that underperform when it comes to how effective their uh, state apparatuses are. Here's, um, this is a little bit easier to look at. This is the same index over the course of uh, about, uh, from 1995 to 2010. We're looking at the government indicator, the government effectiveness scores for just the four countries that actually managed to overthrow their dictators. And what we find is that, and this scale, by the way, is from negative 2.5 to positive 2.5. And what we find is that Tunisia has the most effective state in this part of the world, going back way before the Arab Spring, okay? Um, Egypt comes in second place of these four countries. And then you look at Libya and Tunisia. Uh, you know, these are places, you know, Ye uh, uh, sorry, Li Libya and Yemen. Yemen is in the ninth percentile. Uh, Libya is in the bottom fifth percentile. So the point of this chart is, if you had looked at the World Bank scores for these countries going back 20 years, you would have concluded that Libya and Yemen never had a chance, right? That the state was just far too weak to sustain any kind of uh, democracy. And then you have to ask yourself the question, and we do this in the book, well, why were these states so weak, right? Why was it that these two countries come into this transition with such weak states? And 
With Qadhafi, it turns out it was really, uh, it was really state policy. Uh, so this is uh, Qadhafi's Green Book, which is sort of his attempt to leave something for the ages. And if you read, read the Green Book as I have, unfortunately, you find that Qadhafi really sounds like a libertarian, right? He is, his, major, uh, uh, his major focus is government and how government is the problem. And in fact, he says the major problem confronting human societies is the instrument of government, right? Um, and so what Qaddafi did, if you read the historiography about Libya, is systematically tried to make sure that there was not a strong Libyan state so that he could keep his uh, population relatively atomized and therefore at bay. Um, Libya, if Libya's weak state is a function of the policies of a madman, Yemen is a little bit more complicated and it requires us to know something about the history of this country because unlike, say, Egypt and Tunisia, which are both unitary states at the beginning of the 20th century, Yemen was, for most of the 20th century, divided into two separate polities, an Ottoman-controlled north and a British-controlled south. And neither of those two halves actually enjoyed the kind of centralized authority that is long obtained in Egypt or Tunisia. North Yemen, as we know, is the site of a civil war throughout much of the 1960s between Egyptian-backed Republicans on the one side and Saudi-backed uh, royalists on the other. And in South Yemen, South Yemen, the way the British governed South Yemen, they explicitly did not try to build up a strong state and instead wanted to rule through local intermediaries and uh, chieftains. Um, to use uh, Joel Stork's uh, line, he says, the British conspired to preserve and accentuate tribal divisions and perpetuate an archaic and decaying social order in South Yemen. So just like North Yemen, South Yemen was also a weak state, and it also experienced a civil war from, uh, during 1986 that killed about 10,000 people. So now we've got these two unpromising, fractious polities, right? And they only became a single state in 1990. Okay, and even that single state has had trouble holding. So in 1994, the North and the South fell upon each other in uh, a civil war that left uh, thousands dead and left many issues unresolved between the two states. So it is no surprise that the collapse of the regime of Ali Abdullah Saleh, who is the Northern leader who for all of his prodigious faults is the one who forged the country's shaky unity to begin with, there's no surprise that this guy's fall has led to a collapse of the Yemeni state and resurgence of tribal and regional violence. In fact, what's remarkable is not that Yemen's Arab Spring experiment failed, but that we ever thought it would succeed in the first place, given this history. Okay, so the second thing I wish we would understand, that I wish American policymakers would understand, is that the state is not a thing to be taken for granted. In fact, that's kind of an understatement. I would say in multi-ethnic, divided, tribal societies like Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Yemen, the state is a miracle, okay? And our task around the world should be strengthening states as opposed to weakening them. Okay, so that's lesson number two. Lesson number three is that American arms are not useful in this effort. And I'm not going to go into it. I, I wrote here, see Iraq, Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003, Libya 2011. Um, we are really experts at tearing down states. Building them anew from scratch is something we are much uh, less adept at. Okay, so that's lesson number three, very short. Lesson number four that emerges from this book is that there's really no way forward in this part of the world without the bad guys, right? without the ancien regimes. Now, the Middle East, as we're no doubt aware, is full of bad guys, and this is the reason most of us thrilled uh, to the Arab Spring, because finally these bad guys were being, uh, were being tossed away. But I think what we realize now is that the spirit of revolution, which is going to uh, free us of these uh, awful characters who have oppressed their people for so long, is, um, is wonderful for establishing change, but it's not necessarily useful for helping us to get beyond uh, uh, and get to something new. Um, and so I have a quote here from Alexander Hamilton, who I'm kind of obsessed with because there's this wonderful new musical about him. But I'm not going to read it to you. But the point here is that we have long recognized right, that you cannot move from dictatorship to democracy without somehow including the Ancien regime. The, uh, th there's a reason the old regime was the regime, right? They have concentrated power and authority and resources in their hands. And even when there is 
uh, a shift in political power, they remain important. And so getting to some new stable order requires us to incorporate them. Now, this is morally attract, uh, unattractive, right? What we want to do is we want to defeat the bad guys, right? We want to root them out of public life and maybe even punish them for their abuses. Uh, but it seems to me that taking that approach merely creates a powerful constituency for the collapse of order because those who once fed at the trough of the old regime will conclude that there is no place for them in the new system and therefore they will conspire to undo it. And we talk a great deal about this in the book and particularly we look at the Egyptian case where very little attention was paid to this eternal truth. Both the, and, and still to this day, right? But the irony of Egypt is that both the Muslim Brotherhood when it was in charge and its opponents who are now in charge do not seem to realize that you need to include your opponent if you want to move to some kind of more stable, uh, to more stable system. And I think there's a lesson here for how we should appro have approached the tragedy in Syria and for how we should proceed in Syria. So in March of 2011, as everybody here knows, the people of that great country rose up against uh, their dictator. Um, and this um, Bashar al-Assad, the dictator, his response to this uprising was to kill, to crack down on protesters and initially killing dozens of protesters and then hundreds. But what Bashar also did is he offered some reforms. He fired this unpopular governor. He reduced the length of military service for conscripts. And then in February 2012, he actually went a little bit further and amended the country's constitution to allow multiple parties to compete in upcoming presidential elections and to limit the presidential uh, term to just two seven-year periods. Now, he said, this would only apply to me after I get elected. So he's basically saying, I will rule for 14 uh, more years. And now, Western leaders and Syrian opposition activists, everybody looked at this and said, this is nonsense. These are purely cosmetic reforms. The British Foreign Secretary, William Hague, said that these things fool nobody and that uh, this has no credibility in the eyes of the world. The Syrian National Council said that this is a real farce, a comedy staged by this regime. And what we did is, is we continued to insist that Assad has to go. In fact, these are the words of Hillary Clinton in 2011. The world will not waver. Assad must go. In March of 2015, the same uh, thing came out of the uh, State Department, that uh, we continue to believe that there is no future for Assad in Syria. Okay, that's been our stance. Now, let me be clear. In the annals of modern Arab history, there's no Arab leader who has more blood on his hands than Bashar al-Assad. Right? This regime is entirely bereft of virtue, and if there were justice in this world, it would be dismantled, and he would be made to experience some small measure of the pain that he has inflicted upon millions of his citizens. But this is not a just world. And what we know for certain at this moment is that Assad will not resign peacefully and that his regime will not fracture the way that Egypt and Tunisia's did, which created an opening for some kind of change. In fact, in our book, we identify personalistic hereditary regimes like Syria's as the most cohesive regimes in the face of uprising. So what we did was we actually categorized countries in terms of whether they were hereditary or non-hereditary regimes. And in all of the hereditary regimes, they have been able to withstand uh, protests because these are places where the executive and the coercive apparatus have forged very tight links uh, in order to pave the way for the transfer of executive power from father to son. But the point is those tight links are not easily broken. So, what this means is that the core of the Syrian regime is going to fight until the last Syrian. And the grim fact of the matter is that therefore some compromise with Assad and his regime is necessary if we're going to get Syria to some peaceful uh, 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 landing point. I don't see, in other words, how you can get to a new Syria without making significant guarantees for the old Syria. Okay, and this brings me to lesson five, uh, which is um, uh, very brief. In this, I think we have more in common with our quote unquote enemies than with our allies. Uh, you know, it's common, and so I'm gonna continue thinking about Syria, and this is the point that I don't want my co-authors to be implicated in. Um, so it's common knowledge to, the, to everybody that Assad has two big outside patrons, Iran and 
uh, which shares a kind of religious affinity with Syria because the, the faith of the dominant sect in Syria is, a, is related to uh, Shiism, uh, which Iran is the uh, most important country. And then the other patron, of course, is Russia, which has this naval base on the Mediterranean. And on the other side, arrayed against the Syrians, are our allies of the Arabian Gulf, chief among them being Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which are funding rebel groups inside Syria. So Qatar is patronizing Jaysh al-Fatih, which is an alliance that includes Jabhat al-Nusra, which is an affiliate of al-Qaeda. The, Saudi the Saudis have balked at supporting uh, Jaysh al-Fatih. They're supporting Jaysh al-Islam, the army of Islam, uh, which is made up of Salafi jihadi groups that are not uh, directly linked to al-Qaeda. Now, neither Russia or the US is a friend of the United States. I mean, sorry, Russia or Iran. Uh, Iran is obviously seen by many here and in allied capitals from London to Tel Aviv to Riyadh as some kind of radical fundamentalist regime. Um, and then Russia is scarcely any better, right? Russia suppresses democracy at home. It, like to, it would like to do the same among its immediate neighbors, etc. But if you agree with me that the unfolding disaster in Syria uh, requires some accommodation uh, with what is left of the Syrian state and the Assad regime, then it seems to me that we have more in common with those so-called rivals than we do with our allies, who in my view seem hell-bent on recreating in Syria the situation that we endured in Afghanistan from 1978 to 1989, where outside powers, lots of Gulf countries, uh, were funding radical Islamist mujahideen in order to topple a Russian-backed government. Right? And the result was the complete dismantling of the state, and it has not yet been put back together again. Now, you might be balking at any hint of a suggestion that we should be working with Russia and Iran to bolster what is left of Syria, but I would submit to you, and in, in fact, for a long time, I would never say this publicly, but I would submit that this is a far less radical suggestion than others that are being floated at the present time by people a lot more distinguished than myself. And so, what prompted me to actually think about this was last month, General David Petraeus, who's the former CIA director, proposed that in order to defeat ISIS, the United States should support Jabhat al-Nusra. Right? So the, you, you heard this correctly, right? The former head of the CIA is saying in 2015 that the United States should throw its weight behind an organization loyal to Osama bin Laden, the guy who killed uh, more than 3,000 Americans on September 11th, um, in order to defeat uh, ISIS. I mean, this strikes me as, uh, as dangerous. Um, and compared to that suggestion, my suggestion that we should work with Russia and Iran to somehow restore or bolster some version of the previous Syrian state should be viewed as highly moderate and reasonable. Um, and I think that the American president is finally moving in this direction. If you look at his remarks at the UN last week, uh, he seemed to be suggesting something like this. So I want to be very clear. I think that this is uh, a far cry from the democracy that we had hoped for in Syria. It does nothing to bring uh, justice. But it's my belief that this, the, you know, this is the best hope we have for uh, getting something resembling peace or at least an absence of bloodshed in the near term. And my hope is that whoever succeeds President Obama won't have to relearn this lesson from scratch. Okay, so those are my five lessons. I will finish now by saying that, you know, look, I understand that this is a very dismal vision for uh, the, the Middle East, right? I have not left you with a lot of reasons to be hopeful about the prospects for democracy in the Arab world. If I had more time, I would tell you that, in fact, the only hopeful places I see are the places that we typically tend to code as failures of the Arab Spring, places like Morocco and Jordan, where we've seen some limited constitutional reforms. And particularly in Morocco, I'd say those reforms are not uh, cosmetic. Um, but here's what the upshot of all of this, right? The upshot of this entire talk is that the best social science that we are aware of and that we try to marshal in this book suggests that we should be cautious about the prospect of democratic change in the region, respectful of the institutions of the state, wary of military interventions, reformist, not revolutionary, even when this offends our moral sensibilities, and willing to work with rivals if this furthers our interests. Now, it's far too much to hope that the next president of the United States will take social science seriously, but the prescription that emerges from all of this is that when it comes to the Middle East, whether he's a Republican or a Democrat, the next president of the US would do very well to be conservative. Thank you.
That, I'm told I sit here. With that's where you sit. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You. Uh, do you have a seat? Uh, and uh, we're open for. I've been disenfranchised by myself. <laughs> we're open for a, a discussion. Um, I think my credentials are established in that I said that this is a ver is an excellent book, uh, and so I can open up by saying I don't see how we can arrive at a uh, more moderate future uh, in uh, the Arab world, in your world, um, if we show that it is impossible, and not only that, but we advise uh, that we should take policies to make it impossible. <clears throat> but that said, uh, th that's non-debatable. Um, well, give me a chance. I can debate it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have other things to debate. Uh, you said, uh, just to open it, uh, that uh, the script was written long before. Uh, and I say that all depends on when you call in your bets. Um, harvests and plays end, but history doesn't. So uh, if uh, the history was, uh, or, or if the script was written now, when things are looking bad, uh, how about the script that was written in 2011, uh, when we said it couldn't happen, and then it did happen, and then we have to explain why it happened, as well as why it failed. And if we explain why it happened, uh, then we also have to take into account the explanations for why it might happen again, or why other things can, can happen other than uh, the, the, uh, the vice, uh, in both, uh, both senses of the word, the vice of history that holds us to where we are uh, now. Great, F fantastic question. So I worked it, on it. It depends on what you think the it that happened in 2011 is, right? So, what I hear in your question is that the it, in your view, was some kind of democratic change. Right? That's not what happened in 2011. What I never happened? said that, but that's all right. So uh, what, what was the it that happened in 2011, Bill? S successful, uh, successful in short run, popular uprising. Successful popular uprising happened in one country, in Tunisia. What happened in okay. Egypt? It happened what happened in Egypt? Here's what happened in Egypt. In Egypt, people took to the streets, okay? Mm -hmm. And the military concluded that the man that people were protesting against was a, was, you know, a spent force and got rid of him, right? That's all that happened in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And what happened in Libya? Was Libya a popular, successful popular uprising? No. Libya was a sustained bombing campaign by the greatest military alliance ever to exist in the history of the world. That's the only reason the Qaddafi regime uh, collapsed, right? Um, what happened in, in Yemen? Well, yes, in Yemen there, was, there were protests and the dictator was hustled off into exile. But of course, then what happened? Did they ever have an election? Yeah, well, they did have an election, actually. It was an election with one guy, a uh, presidential election with one guy. And who was that guy? He was the vice president of the person that they uh, kicked out. So I would actually submit to you that the only place that looks similar to the Velvet Revolutions in Eastern Europe is Tunisia. Um, and again, you know, you, know, you know, so I see sort of implicit in your question is, well, you know, at the, at the time, you know, things looked so hopeful and nobody would have made this bet. I will cop to the fact that I didn't make this bet, right? At the time, I'm, I'm uh, you know, a romantic, right? At the time, I was thrilled at what was happening, mm -hmm. right? But other social scientists did make this bet. And I think that um, what's mm -hmm. happened has borne them out. And what it suggests is that, you know, when we look at these kinds of uprisings in the future, and look, they're not only going to happen in the, they're going to happen in the Middle East again, but they're going to happen in other parts of the world, we should not lose sight of these structural impediments to con the conversion of, you know, political instability, because that's really what the Arab Spring proved to be. Converting political instability to democracy is hard, is, is what I'm saying. I won't pursue that, but I'll let you do it. I'm going to take a number of questions because we're really short of time. Thank you for this inspiring presentation. <clears throat> How much of, in your book, is there a discussion of the role of religious authority hegemony in the Arab world? Uh, we have dethroned the ruler. That's a question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, yes. Uh, your, arg your, argument, uh, uh, your argument that e economic development and state capacity and so on uh, are key factors there doesn't come to terms with the fact that I in similarly poor mixed, uh, ethnically mixed countries like Ghana, Tanzania, Malawi, um, you've had relatively successful mm -hmm. democratic transformations. So I ap really appreciate your attempt to integrate the, the literature into uh, application on, th on these cases, but um, if you want to use that as a basis for guidelines for future situations in other parts of the world, you've got to come to terms with other more immediate factors, I think Bill is getting at that, such as, for example, the character of the military. So can I can I can I answer these two and then we can go to the okay yeah so so the uh, we don't really talk about uh, religious uh, authority uh, per se in the book and I, I you know I've written another book about religious parties in the Middle East and in, in, uh, in Egypt in particular and my view is that religious parties themselves do not constitute an obstacle to democracy um, yeah 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 yes. Sure, sure, uh, that, that, and, and we, we don't take those on. I sort of said early on, early on that, you know, my general orientation is that these um, kind of religion and culture don't necessarily constitute the major obstacles, but I, we could talk about this online. Your point about, um, there are absolutely lots of poor, India, right? India is a living rejoinder to the argument that I've been trying to make. Indonesia, living rejoinder to the argument I've been trying to make. So these are exceptions, okay? And, you know, the sort of probabilistically, we would have to conclude that the prospects in places like Egypt and, uh, 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 and Yemen in particular uh, for getting democracy are low. Um, I would, I have something more radical to say, which is that, you know, look, these places that you're describing, they fail, you know, they collapse into authoritarianism with stunning rapidity, uh, with stunning regularity, number one. Number two, if we actually even look at the quality of democracy in those places, I'm not even sure it's, you know, I, you know it almost seems to me that l some of those places, they, they, they are considered democracies in some kind of very thin uh, procedural sense, but if we actually look at the substance of political life in those places, it's, it's much different. Um, so, but, but this is a longer conversation, all of which is to say, look, if you've got to make a bet, again, I show up in the middle of the night and I put a gun to your head and I say, I'll give you the developmental characteristics of a country and I tell you, which, what is it, a democracy or a dictatorship, you've got to bet that, you know, it's, it's going to be a dictatorship. And, and that, to me, is the, the appropriate guide for policy. Yes, lady in the back there. Yeah, we should have some more gender balance in the questions. Yeah. I, that's why I called the lady in the oh, back okay. there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I was supporting you, Bill. You, Tarek, you said at the end of your remarks that uh, one of your U.S. policy recommendations was that the U.S. should support uh, reformist approaches and reforms in Arab countries. But one of the many factors that led to the uprisings of 2011 was the fact that the reform processes that took place in the 80s, 90s, and the aughts uh, failed. They failed miserably. So what, what should be done differently this time to make that actually a viable, like the top-down reform process, a pathway to better governance? So I guess, Amy, uh, you and I may have a different view of what constitutes a fail. So I think we both agree that the reforms that, uh, the political reforms that took place in much of the Arab world through the 90s and, and uh, you know, and, and the 2000s were, fa they failed, right? In your view, they failed because they, you know, didn't lead to democracy. In my view, they failed because they didn't lead to political stability. They didn't satisfy everybody that needed to be satisfied. Yeah, yeah. So, so my, you know, and this, you know, my, to think about Egypt, for example, my prescription during the re revolution in Egypt was, you know, you know, Mubarak had said he was going to resign, right? This was a, a significant qualitative change that, you know, we had never heard anything like this from that regime before. It didn't go as far as revolutionaries would have wanted, which was to dismantle all of the structures of the prior regime, but it went a little bit further than, 
And so I would have endorsed something like that. Now, what would have it had led to if Mubarak had resigned and we'd had, and in fact, I tried to convince people to do this. Mubarak should resign and we should have an election. We should maintain the present Egyptian constitution, maintain everything, have Mubarak resign, have a presidential election, then have a parliamentary election. Here's what's gonna happen, right? What's gonna happen is basically the NDP, is, the ruling party is gonna lose some seats, but still gonna be prominent, and the Muslim Brotherhood's gonna gain a lot of seats, and you're basically gonna have this really terrible, uninspiring political system where power is shared between these two illiberal forces. I think that, compared to what we have now, is a dream, right? Like, oh God, I wish we could get to that state, right? And so, um, so I guess all of which is to say that I do think some limited reforms that would not have led to anything, we would not have led to anything that we would be inspired by, but it might have led to a broadened dictatorship and more political stability in that part of the world. And I guess what I'm trying to say is those kinds of outcomes are, we should now know are nothing to be sneezed at. Right? And so going forward, maybe instead of viewing those outcomes as dramatic failures, we should be more open to them. In the back with the paper up. In the back. We'll stand up and talk. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's thank you, sir. Interesting and very good. Um, right across from North Africa into the heart of the Middle East, you have populations that are under the age of 30, overwhelming majority, 90% or more unemployed, the rest living on a dollar a day, why wouldn't they be radicalized? I mean, how do you even talk about democracy or institution building unless you solve that problem of giving hope to people who have had really no hope? Good, yeah. another question over here somewhere, yes. I will come right to you afterward. <laughs> Just because you sit in the front row doesn't mean you're on the podium. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned a problem with teleology, with assuming that um, democratic government is the sort of expected outcome. So my question is, why take a structural approach and look at characteristics democracies versus the absence of democracy in the Arab world, and why not look at the agency of political actors and events as they unfolded? Well, um, I, I'm not sure that I see how the, the first part of your question relates to the second part of your question. In other words, I think it's possible to be a structuralist and, you know, and criticize uh, tele teleological approaches. I mean, I'm certainly a determinist, but those two things are analytically distinct, determinism and, and uh, this kind of teleological approach. Um, why didn't we focus on the um, sort of strategies of, I mean, we did, right? I, and we, we do, you know, I don't want to leave you the, the impression that what people do in time doesn't matter at all, because of course it matters, right? But what we try to say is that the, your choices are, the tr your choices are constrained, right? So let me give you an example. People say, you know, Mohammed Morsi in Egypt, the dictator who, uh, dictator, uh, the, uh, the the, Egypt's first democratically elected president, should have reached out to the opposition, right? Mm -hmm. And he should have incorporated, he should have, he should have, he should have. Yeah, absolutely he should have, right? The question is, why would he, right? This is a guy at the helm of a party that in parliamentary elections had won, uh, you know, did not win quite a majority, but certainly with the other Islamist party, the Party of Light, they won not just a majority, a super majority. Right? And you're, it's true that in the presidential election he wins with a, a narrow kind of, uh, a narrow majority, but he still wins, right? So this is a political movement that has basically captured all, you know, every time there's an election they dominate. Okay? And he's looking across the aisle to his sort of secular opponents and concluding, why do I need to negotiate with these people, right? I mean, why, why would you need to? You know, Walter Lippmann, 1939, has this great line where he says that for democracy to survive, you need a sufficiently even balance of political power so that the government is not arbitrary, 
you know, doesn't just run roughshod over everybody. And the opposition is not revolutionary and irreconcilable, right? In other words, both of us have to think that we've got a shot of winning, right? And this is even in the Federalist Papers, right? Federalist 10. So the, the point here is that you didn't have that in the Egyptian case, right? In the Egyptian case, you had an Islamist supermajority, and you had a very small uh, performance, a very weak performance by liberals and leftists. And the question is, why was that, right? Why was it that these liberals and leftists in the Egyptian case were electoral ciphers and consequently unable to kind of press, for, press their demands and force the Islamists to... to um, to negotiate with them. And there we say the, argue, the, the answer is really structural, right? It has to do with the nature of civil society. Right? In Tunisia, on the other hand, you did have this relative balance of power. The Islamists get a plurality, but the majority of votes are won by non-Islamist parties, right? And as you know, I think Bill mentioned in the beginning of his talk, one of the organizations in Tunisia that had a lot of organizational ballast on the ground, it was able to get people out and mobilize them. It's not the Islamists, it was the labor union, which you know, to have something similar like that in Egypt would be a dream, right? Well, and so, the, so we look at that and we, we conclude, look, it the reason Tunisia ended well and the reason Egypt didn't end well isn't because Ghanoushi in Tunisia was somehow better than Morsi or people here were smarter than people there, which has also been said to me. It's because they're in, you know, they, they, were, you know, they were constrained in Tunisia in ways that they weren't constrained in Egypt. Uh, and you know, that the structural constraints help us understand the decisions that they made. But the obvious structural answer to the question, why would he, to Morsi, was that he had an army facing him. And if he had any sense, he would have built out and in, in, reached out into other parts of society, even weak ones, which he could then dominate, that would undercut a, 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 the army. So mm -hmm. that uh, to a structuralist, it seems to me, a, a, a Morsi had a lesson to learn. I agree with you that Morsi's major that. opponent was the army. So who did Morsi reach out to? The army. Right? Yep. Morsi made enormous concessions to the army. The constitution of the Muslim Brotherhood yep. made extraordinary concessions to the army, allowed the army to continue with their abhorrent practice of military trials mm -hmm. for civilians, gave the army complete autonomy from any kind of civilian oversight. So Mohammed Morsi was a great student of Bill Zartman, right? He was looking at this political landscape in front of him, and he observed that the most powerful actor was the army. He made all of his concessions to the army. What he didn't understand, right? Was that appointing Sisi would make him fall. No, I don't think it mattered whether he appointed Sisi or not. Yeah. You had, a, you, there was a question from the back though that you haven't answered. Uh, I'm sorry, what, uh, oh, the question in the back was about uh, the, you know, the economic underdevelopment and the high degree, yeah. uh, high youth employment and, you know, the, this is the kind of raw materials for radicalism and political instability and my only answer to that is yes, I agree with you. And I think to come back to the question of the, uh, of the uh, woman uh, here on this side, this is where I do think there's some scope for agency. I look at Tunisia which you know outperforms much of the other oil poor Arab countries on a lot of these you know you know in terms of youth employment in terms of education in terms of uh, in terms of state capacity throughout the you know throughout the period through which we can observe this data and you think to yourself like why did why was Tunisia better and I just keep coming back to the Bourguiba era and policies enacted by Habib Bourguiba that were very different than policies enacted by uh, uh, Abdel Nasser and Abdel Nasser's successors and so there may be there's certainly scope I think for agency in uh, in shaping sort of the economic trajectory that a country takes over decades and you know you would find in me the greatest supporter of Egypt's uh, authoritarian resurgence if I thought that were going to lead to some kind of uh, necessary economic reforms. Unfortunately, I don't see that happen. Last round. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, partial to students in the back. You look like a student. <laughs> that could Thank venture you. into yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK, coming back to the Syrian war, my question is, uh, so we start from the assumption that this conflict has to be solved, okay, has to be settled. But do you really think that the situation in Syria really affects U.S. interests? Because I'm for, sure it have, for sure Russia and, uh, and Iran has stakes in Syria. But, uh, I mean, U.S. allies, uh, for the, the conflict in Syria and the situation with ISIS 
does really affect U.S. SLI's interest in the, in the area, like Saudi Arabia and, and, and Israel. Are their national security really menaced by the situation? Probably not. That's a question. Uh, there was an answer, too, but that's yours. And I'm partial to women. Yes, last question. Structural factors, you presented the role of England and France in setting up the states after World War I, but you didn't mention any other outside influences since then. For example, the United States' uh, support of Egypt's military and other militaries in the region, our oil interests in, in the Gulf, and what do you think would have happened in Bahrain if Saudi Arabia and our military interests had not intervened? Great question, great question. Um, so so um, just very briefly, uh, you, you know, I do think that there is a U.S. interest in stemming uh, the flow of blood in Syria. I mean, I, mean I, I will admit that my own concern about Syria is probably not as interest-driven as I made it out to be. I mean, I would like to see this humanitarian catastrophe ended. Um, but at the same time, I would, I would submit to you that you know, the refugee crisis that we're now observing in Europe, eventually these refugees, many of them are going to be absorbed into Europe. And I, I alluded earlier to how Europeans have concerns that are both reasonable and unreasonable about these refugees. Some of their concerns are that these refugees are going to be future inhabitants of the back alleys of Rotterdam or the banlieues of, of Paris, and they're going to be f perpetrators of f future versions of the Charlie Hebdo massacre or, or the Theo van Gogh killing. You know, Europe is having a trouble absorbing the Muslims who are European, let alone these. So I think if stopping the flow of, of, of stopping the crisis will ameliorate the refugee problem, which hopefully will then ameliorate this problem of you know, Europe's uh, very unhappy encounter with uh, its Muslim inhabitants, I think that, an, that alone is, um, is an important uh, reason uh, to care about this. Um, the question here was about, um, about the role of the United States uh, and outside powers in uh, undergirding authoritarianism, right? Um, so the, and then you ended, your particular question was about Bahrain, right? What would have happened in Bahrain if the Saudis hadn't come in to backstop the... And we had. Uh, okay, uh, and we hadn't at least, yeah, turned a blind eye to it or... or uh, and I don't know. Um, I, I think that the outcome would have been similar to the outcome that you observe in, uh, that you observe in uh, Assyria today. Uh, it would have been a pretty grim outcome. Uh, but that outcome isn't a liberal democracy either, right? And I would submit to you that the outcome, you know, this, maybe the Bahrain intervention is the one place where I'd say the Saudis, it's the one case I can think of the Saudis intervening to strengthen an existing state as opposed to bring it down. Because remember, what have the Saudis been doing? What has the entirety of their foreign policy been over the course of the last 30, 40 years? It's been weakening states, right? Going all the way back to what the flow of Arab Afghans into Afghanistan, right? So I would actually say Bahrain may be the one case where I'd say, the Saudis maybe didn't play such a, a, a miserable role. <clears throat> That's a strange happy note to end on, but our lease, <laughs> our lease has run out, and we thank you. It's a very good presentation. <laughs>